I thought long and hard about doing this video. It's probably the hardest video I've ever tried to finish because all my life I have been pro-life. I've never understood abortion. But yet, it was just this dark thing that was over there, and uh, no one I knew was suffering from having had an abortion or going through the pain of trying to consider it. It was just there. Then, you know, I was praying the other day, other morning, and... and uh, I was uh, asking God, I said, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm out on YouTube and uh, trying to get the good news out about Jesus Christ. And I'm doing a lot of different things, everything from building uh, DIY stuff to cooking to growing gardens, installing chimneys, and just... Uh, usually involving scripture along the way. And I said, Lord, but I keep getting this feeling that I should be doing something deeper. Show me what that's supposed to be. That day, I got a phone call from a wonderful place called Dakota Hope. And they were looking at my photographs and they wanted to buy them to put them in their clinic. And I said, uh, what, what kind of clinic do you have? And she said, it's a pregnancy resource clinic. And I said, what, what is a pregnancy resource clinic? So she went on to tell me it's a Christian faith-based organization to give women another choice than abortion. And um, uh, pro-life, and I said, uh, well, if you're saving babies, you can have my pictures and I'll figure, and we'll get them printed for your new clinic. And that's in our town, Botno, North Dakota, a little tiny town, but they've been saving thousands of babies. And so I took that as God's point in me. He says, you need to pay attention to this because abortion is a huge stain on America and the world. And it's got to stop. I'm pulling my hand away from America, and you can see the results all around you. Ugh. Lawlessness. Everything is right out of Matthew. Matthew 24, where Jesus said what it would be like in the end days. So we printed them. They got the clinic finished. I'll have a bit of that in this video. But what happened after that was they invited us, me, Linda and I, to a banquet. And we uh, went to the banquet and listened to two of the speakers that'll be in this video. One, a very strong woman who gives her testimony about her abortion. It's... Uh, heart-wrenching to listen to. And the other one who sat at Linda and I's table is Carol. Carol ran an abortion franchise in Texas. Dallas, Texas, I think. She currently lives in Round Rock. And we talked with her and she gave her testimony. It's a, it's a, a, a Paul testimony, 
Paul was killing Christians and then came back to be an apostle that spread the gospel everywhere. Hers was she killed 35,000 babies and ran an abortion clinic all for the dollars. She wanted to be a multimillionaire. And what she told me was, well, it's in this video, the dark, dark side of the abortion industry. They're not allowed to help women. They're out for a quick cure to a problem or what people perceive to be a problem. And so that's what this video is about, is Dakota Hope, this wonderful organization that gives women a real choice. And the stories they have told me, like, when a, a young couple come in and they want to are thinking of an abortion, the first thing they do, well, they check to make sure it's a legitimate pregnancy, and then they ultrasound. And they said fifty percent of the time, when these young men see the heartbeat of their child, they say, "Wait a minute, we'll make it work." I think that's an amazing story. So there's good and bad in this video because there's some... <sighs> Carol talks about some hardcore underbelly darkness to the abortion industry. So if you don't want to see any of that or hear this message, I understand it. But I feel compelled to put it out. I feel like God asked me to put it out in the hopes that someone might see and change their mind even if it's just one. So, it's a valuable video. Uh, I'd appreciate you watching it. And uh, all the way through, it's long, uh, almost 30 minutes. But if you want to know about abortion and the truth to pro-choice and women's health, uh, the abortion industry isn't really interested. So... Um, I, I would suggest you watch this video, especially if you're in that situation and making a choice. This child would have been somebody who would have changed the dynamic of our family. And the relationships that they would have created would have changed everyone that they interacted with. 28 years but they're ago, not here. At the age of 21, I was forced into an abortion by my parents and the man I was in a relationship with. He wanted nothing to do with me and the baby if I kept it. My parents' reaction to my pregnancy is recorded in my mother's diary. When Tanya called me that night to tell us that she was pregnant, we did not tell her what she wanted to hear. We told her now was the time to get rid of it. A majority, maybe upwards of 80% of abortions in America happen with some form of coercion. In other words, not a woman's choice. The number one, one slogan for abortion is pro-choice. And the ironic thing about that slogan is that when you ask women who had abortions, why did you have that abortion? The number one response is, I felt that I had Choice. A majority In most cases, it's not a choice at all. A decision is reached without all the facts or based on misinformation. Other options are not presented and a deadly course of action is forced on a woman. The government mandates warnings on every other potential danger. Every pack of cigarettes, every alcoholic beverage, every package of medication carries a warning of potential health risks. Why not a warning on something so life-changing, so life-threatening as an abortion? But we all have that moment where we realize that we are moms and we killed our children. It's pretty sick. It's a sick feeling. While these lawyers were calling for the right of choice for women, where's the choice when only one option is offered? That's an essential fallacy in the woman's so-called right to choose. See what you were doing. Again, my guest today 
is Carol Everett, and she's the author of Blood Money, uh, Getting Rich Off of a Woman's Right to Choose. She also heads up the Heidi Group, which we're going to be talking about here in the second half of the program. About. And so Carol uh, was an insider. She uh, was a co-owner of abortion clinics and, and since then has uh, obviously renounced that and come to faith in Jesus Christ and is also leading a ministry called the Heidi Group. So Carol, thanks for being on the program today. Thank you for inviting me, Mark. But I read your book way back in the day when I started out in this work because it was really, as far as I can tell, probably the best book that's ever been written about what goes on inside abortion centers. I saw the financial side, the money, and I saw the way to become a millionaire by selling abortions to other women. I didn't draw a salary. I worked on a strike commission, $25 for each abortion. And many in the abortionists work on a strike commission and many mm-hmm. others in the abortion industry work on a strike commission. And, you know, the last month we did 545 abortions. My income was $16,625, $625 or something. And I plan to become a millionaire selling abortions. Okay. Abortion is a skillfully marketed product sold to a very frightened person. Pregnancy. They have worked very hard to learn how to get Medicaid funds, and they want to increase their tax funding to $700 million But I will say this. I don't believe there's anyone working in an abortion clinic that does not come there out of some pain. Mm-hmm. It may be incest. It may be rape. It may be abortion. But they're there because they're justifying something in their own lives. Some deep, deep pain. And um, I look at it as a place of great hurt. Yeah. You know, those abortion clinics are filled with employees who are hurting mm-hmm. and justifying their own pain every day. We know abortion is not health care, first of all. Right. It's murder. But um, mm-hmm. it's a combination. It's a lie they've heard and some, for some reason incorporated into their own belief system. It's become one of their core beliefs in most cases. And so they justify it on a daily basis. So you were in it for the profit, but you were also dealing with the pain of your abortion uh, you know, abortion is clearly a profitable business. It's an industry that makes millions of dollars, billions of dollars for that matter. The folks that perform the abortions are not typically the upper level physicians, that is. I mean, they're, they're bottom feeders. They tend to be the lower rung of the medical profession. Was that your experience? Yes. And at the time I was in the industry, abortion clinics were completely unregulated. Now, to some extent, the pro-life movement has been able to move that to a higher level of regulation. But abortion Mm -hmm. clinics are still not regulated in any state at the same level as ambulatory surgical facilities. I mean, we have someone coming in from Hawaii into Texas to do abortions. I mean, what happens if a patient has a complication? She can't take that person to the uh, hospital and follow through with medical care. She doesn't. She's not licensed to practice in Texas or She's not a, a on the hospital staff. So what do you what do you do with all that? They're just Tyrone. He's yeah. a photographer. Tyrone. Uh, what was it? Tyrone. Tyrone. He's our medical director, Doctor. Oh, he's going to be our he's our medical director for the yeah. clinic here. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Yes, we are super blessed. So I actually pulled up the ultrasound machine and actually brought up pictures so you can actually see the quality of our oh, ultrasound machine. Oh, nice. So and this is, right? This one's, um, I think this How one's weeks? 16 weeks. I was going to say, that doesn't look like a no, six-week No, not, we don't goal. do yeah. so typically this part a lot, but she let me practice sure. on the machine. Sure. And you actually can see his tongue sucking right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Huh? Wow. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, this machine's pretty nice. I'll try to pull it, but I'm just curious what the question was. Sure, yeah. sure. So, um, as you know, we do the free pregnancy test and ultrasounds, mm-hmm. and then I do do the consultation on their options. And sure. so I'll go through um, the different options, especially with the abortion, the um, two types of abortion, the panel and the surgical abortion. And then I let the women know that we have the option for abortion pill reversal in the event they take that first pill and haven't taken the second pill. Right. They can call the network to get that information to try to get the reversal. Mm-hmm. I'll talk to the young woman about the options. If they do go down the abortion path, that we do have post-supportive 
groups for that and called Discover Peace. But I'll share with them that um, abortion has PTSD syndrome called PAS, which is post-abortive syndrome, very much like a traumatic experience that someone has. So a young woman has all that information to make a good informed decision. And a lot of times talking to them about if you've had past traumas, having an abortion is only going to amplify some of that past as well. So I try to make sure they really truly understand what's going to happen. So yes, she'll have that relief right after abortion because the pregnancy is over, but it's later on that it begins yeah. to haunt you and hurt you mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, but I'll talk about adoption and the different types of adoptions that open or closed or partial. And then, uh, of course, parenting. And with parenting, we'll support you all the way through with the parenting skills that we will offer through our parenting classes. So in here is where I'll do consultation and the ultrasound, oh. and then we'll lead into wow. the education. Cool. Yeah. Which, so are which you connected with some uh, of I just adoption know number. agencies? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I heard you did all the photography in here. Yeah, this is so she called up and so we hooked her up with a few yeah. photographs. Yeah. So this is our education room. We have what price course lessons. They're all evidence-based lessons that you have in here. So the development of the baby, how to take care of yourself during your pregnancy, the importance of prenatal care, ultrasounds. Um, they'll talk about what to expect first yeah, trimester, second, third trimester. Then they'll go into labor, and delivery, postpartum, um, breastfeeding videos, infant care, all the way through to the years, how to deal with body training, tantrums, whining. And they watch these videos and they earn points to shop in our baby boutique. Sure. We have more videos than just that. We have co parenting. So if they're working on daily with co parenting, how to set up schedules, how to deal with holidays, how to communicate. Then we have life skills, budgeting, buying your first car, and um, even interview skills, and then relationship building. So setting healthy boundaries, how to communicate. So we have more than just videos on taking care of baby. And then we have five lessons as well. So if someone's interested in knowing more about God, we have the opportunity to share faith with them. And then there's lessons on that. So, like I said, it, they're evidence based, but then we have some faith based as well. So, this is way early on during counseling at support after. After baby's born. Or. We work, what we'll be working with the whole office for those whose kiddos are in foster care and they need to get their kiddos back and they need to start working on parenting skills. Oh, well, that's you. We use that as well. Or if you've got, we had an example of a gentleman who uh, got a girl pregnant and she was actually considering abortion and he wanted to keep the baby. So he wanted to take classes so that he could take the baby the moment she delivered. So he started doing parenting classes just to become the best dad he could. Those are some amazing stories. Yeah. Wow. So they're in English and we have a bunch of Espanol too. So Spanish lessons. I had a question earlier, you know, like the uh, um, coverage area, there's nothing set. It's like anybody that comes in, comes in, and that could even be Canada then. If they wanted to, we yeah. don't turn away anyone. It, it is free services, so we don't turn it. I've had people from Montana go over. Oh. Um, to tie them back. Um, yes. That's even better. You know? Yes. Because a lot of that's needed over Turtle Mountain, too. A lot. Yes. So if they so. can come. And so we did the videos. We tried to do it in person because you have that one on one to work with them. They get more points that way if they come in person and if they bring their support person. So if, whether it's a boyfriend or a mom or sister or whoever, so they can work together, they'll get more points. I will send it to them on their phone. When you're in North Dakota, the weather's not always great. And there's also just travel for them that can be a hardship too. So maybe they don't have a chance to travel here. So I can send videos to them at home. So they get 10 points for watching the video, 10 points to do a homework, and there's worksheets. There's questions to ensure that they're really 
So I can go on and see if they're getting them all wrong, and I kind of question them during we watch the video. So then I'll have a conversation with them. So it's not, I'm just sending a video and never talk to them. I try to communicate with them. Any questions about the video, any concerns, and anything really stem from that video that we need to talk about? Or did that make you think, hey, I want this video for next week? So when we come in person, I have an opportunity to see how things are going. So once the kiddos are born, if they're like, oh my goodness, we need this baby will not go to sleep. I have videos on how to get well, schedules at the beginning of the person. Are most of the clients you have, are they hurting financially, most of them, or some of them are? I have actually, in my mind, I have a teacher that's taking these classes. She's never been around babies, and so she's a teacher, so she's an educator at heart, but she doesn't know anything about babies or delivery. Well, so she's taking these classes not because she needs things from the baby boutique, but because she wants to learn. So I have several clients that financially are stable, but just want to learn. Hmm. And then I have some that are completely in hardship and they depend on these diapers that they get from watching the videos or the wipes or clothes or whatever. I had this flash uh, light bulb come on. I get those in there. They always get me in trouble. They <laughs> usually take time. But, and I'll just run this by you is for this area. It's not too far of travel. For those that couldn't afford it, I'd be willing to give like newborn photographs or family photographs pro bono. Just we can also do it so they can earn too. Oh well, that's even better. And if they could afford it, then you could say a free will offering to the clinic. Sure, sure. And I'll go out. I'm usually landscape and. Um, wildlife, but I'll show, I'll send you yeah, some be because I had a lot of people ask for newborn. Yeah, I saw that. I, I was looking through some. I said there wasn't very many for her to pick from. I said maybe I should send this. So that was really yeah. cool. And we were initially we try not to do baby items to get like glaring at individuals because then that turns them off. Like we won't see baby items out here in the main areas. We yeah. want them to come in and have a conversation. So oh, I just felt led to do that one to see how that would impact. So, well, very cool. We'll see so, how that works. Yeah, so we, let's go to the baby boutique. So you can see the like Hours up here. Great, move on. <laughs> Yeah. So only two days a week on my bus. Wow. Yeah. yeah, if you have somebody in your office and you need me to come up, and if I'm able, I'll come up. Sure. Just shoot me a text. So are you all right here at Andrews? Yep, I'm over at St. Andrews. Oh. Yeah. How long have you been there? Uh, about a year. Labor Day last year was when I started. So wow. And they love them up there, so we yeah. right here. I'm not saying you know fluffing his feathers here, but I've heard great things already. Good. Yeah. I wouldn't have called them if I didn't hear. Great yeah. Things. So these are the items. So as I mentioned, you, they can earn up to 50 points. So these diapers are 10 points. So that kind of gives you. Yeah. Oh, that's points. what the points were for. So they can yes. purchase from yeah. here. So your outfits might With be 15, 15 ish points. So it just depends on the items. The wipes are only five. These are all great ideas. They're so I haven't amazing. finished pricing everything, but they can save up their points for the larger items for like cribs, car seats, strollers. Mm. Those are usually dollar for dollar. So if it's a two hundred fifty dollar car seat, then I want two hundred fifty two sixty points for it. Wow. Yeah. Usually that's how we do it. Mm. So and cool. what's the average like video point for so the mission? Ten minutes for the video, ten for the worksheet, ten for the homework, and then ten for coming in person, and ten if they bring their support house. Fifty per video every two weeks. Gotcha. Now if they're really in desperate need because they came to me and they're in their third trimester and they haven't learned anything and they're gonna deliver in two weeks, I might do every other day videos. Sure. You know, two or three times a week or something. Right. So I was just thinking, though, if you're trying to get, you have absolutely nothing and you don't have the money to buy a stroller, car seat, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, well, it's week 32. And that timeline doesn't work. Yeah. Not, not for those, and I'm not going to recommend that they 
have it as a second hand store or some more and get used items. But we're going to try to work with the Google office to have some used items upstairs for those really desperate needs. But I'm not trying to give free handouts. I want them to prove it and have that responsibility of earning things for their families. But even, uh, there's going to be time. You know, the sped up version of, well, uh, yeah. you have eight weeks, let's, let's do it every other week, let's do it let's do twice a week. Or twice a week, correct. Yes, it's, it's for our discretion, yes. But I try to be fair about it, but also we need to work for it. Right. Yeah. But we do have those moments of domestic violence where the person has to get out, they left all their sure. items, I'm going to get them whatever they need to get them to right. safety and get them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And in that piece, have you worked, I don't know much about the Family Crisis Center, but have you been in contact with them at all? I will know? be. I haven't worked on all that. Yeah. Just trying to get this going first. <laughs> right. but yes, this I will was, be working. And I don't, honestly, I, I know very little about the Botnums Family uh, Crisis Center, but I know that it's downtown. Mm -hmm. I'll be work going around meeting with them all. Some of them have come by today and dropped off information, so sure. it's just me going to meet with them, make sure right. I have all. Because I'll do a resource sheet. So when I meet with a pregnant mom, um, one of the things I give them is a whole packet. Uh, and it will include the local um, OBGYNs, which there really isn't much yeah. around here. Yeah. So, um, and then I will give them warning signs to be seen. And then I give them a resource list of what's available in their community. So that will be what will be in our kit that we give to them when right. they are pregnant. In addition to their prenatal, I'll ask if they're on it. If they're not, we have free prenatal that you sign your name to sure. get. So. so you're going to be here until you find somebody? Did I overhear some people who are interested out here in the well, lobby? Sure interested. So what he's asking is, right now, as a traveling nurse, I'm going to be here till we can either hire somebody sure. to be here, and I'll just come up for the ultrasounds. So I'll be coming twice a week until we figure out who can be here in person. Okay. I did Thai yoga since last October. I travel twice a week to October. Yeah, I caught you on the road a couple times. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> 84 miles one way. Yeah. They're just yeah. butchering women and leaving them. We had one girl, 22 years old, a model, who danced in, jumped up on the table, laughed at the doctor that she didn't wear underwear. She was 22 weeks pregnant. We put her on the table. now. There's a maneuver called the Hansen's Maneuver. Now the doctor may do it himself or someone may do it, but I did it for the big baby, two of our big baby abortions. I held the babies and you say the head's here, the feet are here, the buttocks are here, and you gently push the baby down into the instruments. And the first time this doctor went in, he pulled out omentum. That's the lining to the intestines. He literally perforated her uterus and was pulling her bowel out her uterus with the very first time he went in with the, the instruments. And the second time he went in, he pulled out her bowel and he pushed it back in, live baby, woke the woman up, put her in my car because it's terrible, terrible advertisement to think about having an ambulance in front of an abortion clinic. You just don't want it. So we put her in my car and we didn't take her to the hospital nearest us. We didn't take her to the hospital that would take the best care of her. We took her across town to a hospital that would help us cover up what we'd done. And this surgeon has taken this girl who has a perfectly complete baby inside her with her bowel pulled out her vagina upstairs to the operating room. Seven doctors operated on that baby, on that girl. They had to do a colostomy to resection her bowel to empty into this bag. They pulled the baby out. He rolled it into the disposable drapes and put it into the incinerator at the hospital. All seven of those doctors falsified the records. We killed that baby that way. The doctors falsified the records. We told that girl she had an abdominal pregnancy. Quickly, you know, I'm a Christian. I have a Bible in the top right hand drawer of my desk. I want you to know I tithe on all this money. I pray every day. I didn't tell him I prayed there'd be a lot of abortions and I prayed none of those women would be injured that day. But um, he didn't stop there. He just listened to me and then he said, you know, Carol, God loves you. He loves you and he knows you can't be good enough. You can't work hard enough. You can't get yourself to heaven. 
but he made a way of escape for you by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. And by a simple act of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, your life can change. That was a, at all. Like but when I walked in, something was different. The women were all crying. I'd never seen that before. I started taking them back to my office and talking them out of having abortions. And at the end of that day, I was not saying, isn't this great? I saved yeah. 25 babies today. I didn't look at it that way. I, I said, okay, three babies didn't die today, but I was very confused and fell to my knees and prayed, Lord, if there is a Lord, if this is not where you want me, hit me over the head with the two by four. And the two by four was that we were caught attempting to do abortions on women who were not pregnant by the wow. media. And that, that was my answer to prayer. 27 days after that pastor came in and said, we'd be leaving in 30 days. And I was the one that walked out the door with it. Uh, and Carol has overseen over 35,000 abortions. Uh, the death of one woman, I'd like to get into that as well. And uh, women, you know, having surgery because of failed abortion attempts. Uh, so, Carol, uh, you, you, you prayed the prayer, you came to faith in Christ, you walked out of the abortion center. Tell, tell uh, our audience what you were doing in the abortion center to sell abortions to women. We had an unwritten goal of three to five abortions from every girl between the ages of 13 and 18. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that sex education sells abortions man that sold abortions and it was called sex education break down their natural modesty separate them from their parents and their values and become the sex expert in their life so they turn to us when we would give them a low dose birth control pill they would get pregnant on or a defective condom because we didn't buy the most expensive condoms we bought the cheapest condoms our goal was three to five abortions from every girl between the ages of 13 and 18. We gave so we would, I went into the schools. We had others that went into the schools and we would tell the kiddos that we were there and that, you know, their parents didn't understand them. Their parents would tell them not to have sex. The parents would do all these things. But what we started doing was breaking down the natural modesty as early as kindergarten by asking them what their parents said to call their private parts. They all had a different name. So by the end of that time, when three or four children had different names, it was clear to the children that their parents didn't know what they had, but we were the experts. Then we moved to the first, second, and third grade, calming them down and telling them to look at their own private parts and, and expecting change just from that because we were breaking down the morals and we were breaking down all of the, um, the parents' rules of the things that they'd been taught at home. And by the fourth and fifth grade, they're really starting to experiment, but we would encourage them to masturbate. Literally, the abortion mm. industry, Planned Parenthood, encourages them to masturbate in the mm. fourth and fifth grade alone and in groups of four or five of the same sex. What is the what lifestyle is that leading to? And then in the fifth and sixth grade, we were ready to pass out condoms. We were ready to prescribe birth control pills if they could get into the clinic. And when they came to the clinic, we gave a low-dose birth 13, control 19. pill. We gave them a low-dose birth control pill that in order to provide any level of activity had to be taken at the same time every single day. The girl wouldn't take it accurately. And if you miss that thing, the protection is out of her system. The sexual activity goes from zero or once a week to five to seven times a week. She doesn't take the pill properly. She gets pregnant. And who does she call There's when she's pregnant? pregnant. So you were awesome. doing things. I mean, you were actively doing things to help women get pregnant, basically. So they would come to you for their abortions. Yes. Yes. The abortion industry actively reaches out. Look at what Planned Parenthood says and all their information about what they do with teens. They are actively reaching into the schools and touching our children and, and leading them down paths that parents certainly would not participate in. And what they do is they get the kids to laugh at their parents and their values. The kids are not going home going to go home and tell the parents what happened they're embarrassed and if they come to school of course that embarrasses a child so there is no way that the parents are finding out everything that's happening in that classroom mm -hmm. once a month we were putting a woman in my car and transporting her to a hospital not the closest mm -hmm. hospital not the hospital that would take the best care of her but to a hospital that would help us protect us from the public from the media cover, cover up the abortion help. Yeah. We were covering up abortions once a month for the last 18 months. One out of every 500 women was hospitalized for a hysterectomy, a colostomy, and one woman 
bled to death, died. Let, let's talk about the conditions inside your abortion centers. Uh, you know, we we see reports often about abortion centers being dirty and and unsanitary and all of that. Was that the case in your in your or was yours more professional, if you will? We well, sterilized instruments, except on a day when you had fifty and you couldn't and you had twenty one sets of instruments and you couldn't turn them fast enough and get them cooled. You couldn't sterilize them, cool them, and get to the abortionist so he could use them that many times. And on those days. You just dipped them in Sidex, which is a sterilizing uh, liquid, but you couldn't leave them as long as it said. We weren't using completely sterilized instruments on a busy day. Also the head of Heidi Group, and she's with me today, and we're talking about uh, her experience as an abortion clinic owner, franchise owner, co-owner, and what led her to do what she did, and then her conversion to Jesus Christ, and now being a strong pro-life advocate, uh, going around the country, speaking to pro-life audiences. Look at the Biden plan for the abortion industry. They want to cover every county, every parish in the nation. Our job as pro-lifers is to stand up in every county and every parish in the nation and stand up for what we believe. We've got to protect our children, our grandchildren from the ungodly practices they're teaching in our schools. And we've got to educate on the life issues so they understand that life begins at conception. She calls us. We're the experts. And we were ready. We used a script designed to overcome every single objection. That's what sales is. Overcome the objection and you get the order. In this case, the abortion. And uh, when she calls, the first question is reassure. And so the girl confesses, I think I may be pregnant. And the counselor, is, who's really a telemarketer, that's all they're trying to do, sell over the telephone, but we call them counselors, says, we can take care of your problem. No one needs to know. And then the first question, what's the first day of your last normal period? And she gives this so-called counselor the date, and she says you're eight weeks pregnant. She didn't say you might be eight weeks pregnant. She didn't say you could be. She said you are eight weeks pregnant. So she has planted the first seed in this long marketing thread. And the sad thing is, in this girl's mind, she is the expert. This is the pregnancy expert. And the next question is, is this good news or bad news? If it were good news, she would not be calling an abortion clinic. It's bad news. And when she replies bad news, this counselor moves right in because now she wants to identify the fear, to use it to reaffirm that abortion decision anytime that girl moves away. And if she says, well, maybe, maybe I need to think about this. Your parents will kill you. You'll have to miss drill team. The abortion so. Now, abortions are done through all nine months of pregnancy, not because of Roe v. Wade, but because of Doe v. Bolte that said for the health of the mother, an abortion can be completed through all nine months of pregnancy. But the problem was that health was defined as mental health. And we would say to this scared young woman, you would have problems with this pregnancy should you carry it to term, wouldn't you? She'd say yes, and we'd chart it emotional health. She came in chewing her gum and looked so carefree she had her abortion. She came back two weeks later for her checkup. Didn't come out of the room, didn't come out of the room, opened the door, and she was in there. She would brought, brought in a piece of glass and slitting her wrist. 12 years old. In crisis. They buy that product expecting a fix and find it's defective. So we put a clinic out on 30. It uh, paid for itself in the first month. It was a profit center and we were well on the way to opening more clinics. As a matter of fact, our plan was to open three abortion clinics in 1983 so I could be a millionaire in 1984. You know, they came in for two or three hours and wanted to do 20 abortions or 30 abortions and make their money and go away. They didn't care if the instruments weren't clean and they didn't care if the instruments weren't cool. They just wanted to get their money and get through the day and go. There was a receipt on the chart. They would collect them, bring them up at the front at the end of the day, we would balance them. Pay them in cash, no 1099, no W-2. But I'm certain people killing babies for a living probably reported it to IRS, don't you think? We, we knew how many people, how many calls they got and what their percentage of completion was. And their raises were based on the percentage of completed abortions. And they got bonuses. And very quickly, it was no longer about selling abortions to other women. It was about money. I saw the potential to make great money. I answered the phone at home at night so we wouldn't miss an abortion. But she is allowed to watch her pregnancy test turn positive or negative, and they would point to a chart on the wall and say, this is a positive test and this is a negative test, and if it's positive, 
we trained our people to reach over and grab the bony part of her elbow and squeeze. And you see, she's confused. She's hurting. She's just gotten this news that she's pregnant, and she's upset. So you grab the bony part of her elbow and squeeze to get her attention and say, if you have your money, we can take care of this right now. We knew if she went home and talked about it, her support system might help her and might tell her abortion wasn't the answer, but if she just did it right then, it was taken care of. But a certain percentage of those pregnancy tests are negative. They're not all positive. And remember, it costs the same amount of money to get a non-pregnant one in as it does a pregnant one. So if her test was negative, we had a different sales technique. We said, this test is negative. But you know, this test is not sensitive enough to pick up a very early pregnancy. You could still be pregnant and this test would be negative. And you want to know for sure today, don't you? And she would say yes. And we'd say, okay, we have another test we can do. We will just do this sonogram. And we put her on that table as I could put any man, woman, or child on that table. And I could find a pregnancy. You see, all you have to do is find a blob. And everyone's abdomen has a blob. And this girl doesn't know what a pregnant uterus looks like versus a negative one, so you just find a little blob in the abdomen. You flip it around and say, see there, there it is, you're pregnant. She's shocked. You grab the bony part of her elbow and say, if you have your money, we can just take care of it today. You know, we were doing 20, 30 abortions an hour if we could, at least 20. We had 21 sets of instruments. That's all we had. So we couldn't possibly bring those instruments out, clean them, sterilize them, bring the temperature up in the sterilizer for tw and then 20 minutes sterilization and then cool them down. Our complication rate at the end of my time, last 18 months was when about one out of every 500 had a major life-changing surgery or died. We had one woman die. But because there are no real statistics and if you can cover it up, you don't report it. And none of ours were ever reported. So we don't really know. The big hospital, in Dallas will tell you, the doctors will tell you that they saw botched abortions or see botched abortions all the time. One of the reasons we were able to regulate the abortion clinics in Texas was because of the bad abortionists that had been reported. I mean, one girl died and they went in to examine the clinic and they were using rusted instruments and had no sterilizer and no hot water. But uh, no one talks about what happens inside the abortion clinic and everyone fights. It's the most chaotic place you can imagine. Um, the doctors fight, the nurses fight, everybody's taking drugs, everybody's on drinking, it's, you know, they're having a fair. I recognized I'd been involved in the death of 35,000 babies. The murder of one woman who bled to death from a second trimester abortion. 19 women who'd had hysterectomies or colostomies and never had one appeared in the newspapers, no lawsuit. But the thing I couldn't deal with was the fact that I had taken the life of my own child by abortion. You can't deal with death and lies on a daily basis without being greatly affected by it. And nobody worked in that clinic that didn't go to the back and put baby's parts together. And even if you didn't put the parts together, there were times when you walked back there and they were on a towel. Delivering a head is very, very difficult, even at, say, 20 weeks. I mean, I had one abortionist keep a girl on the table for six hours trying to crush a head. He couldn't do it. I felt them taking parts out of my body. You know, I've spent the better part of 20 years trying not to remember that. Somebody else but was I in there with him. But I went in toward the end, and I'd never seen that much blood. I mean, you know, just blood everywhere. And we put her in the recovery room, and she just filled the bed. And we changed the bed a couple of times, and her blood pressure was erratic, and the doctor left. I was really worried about her, and I tried to call him. And her boyfriend kept wanting to go home, and her blood pressure stabilized a little bit. but. I just didn't believe she was, you know, it's just like that feeling you have that she's not right. Well, at 10 o'clock, the boyfriend said, look, if there's anything happens, I'll call you immediately. And at 4.30, he called the doctor and he didn't take the history and he put, he said, put her in a tub of hot water and when he did, the last little bit of blood in her body ran out. And he called me about six and said, she's dead. And he immediately started telling me how he was gonna do the cover up. And somehow it all worked out and the autopsy didn't show anything. And no charges were filed and nothing happened. The newspapers didn't call, nobody came. 
we kill that woman and, and did abortions the next morning.